In the early 20th century, Cunard Line faced fierce competition on the North Atlantic from the German steamship Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse and its counterparts. However, Cunard lacked the financial means to respond adequately. In 1902, J.P. Morgan acquired White Star Line and aimed to add Cunard to its maritime empire. Concerned about a major British shipping company falling into foreign hands, Prime Minister Arthur Balfour intervened. He proposed subsidizing the construction of two large liners that would compete for the coveted Blue Riband and break the record for being the largest passenger vessels in the world. The conditions were that Cunard remained British and that the new liners would be built to admiralty standards to be used as armed merchant cruisers should war ever break out. With government support secured, Cunard searched for shipbuilders capable of undertaking the monumental task of construction. Swan and Hunter shipbuilders in Wallsend-upon-Tyne, a relatively small company, convinced Cunard to entrust them with constructing Mauritania. John Brown in Clydebank, Scotland, was chosen to build the other liner, Lusitania. This contract was incredibly ambitious for Swan and Hunter, considering how small their shipbuilding yard was and the fact that a much larger slipway would need to be constructed to accommodate the new liner. At 790 feet in length, 240.7 meters, and an 88-foot beam, 26.8 meters, Mauritania would be almost a meter longer than her sister ship. While Lusitania would be 31,550 gross register tons, her larger sister would beat that number by almost 400 GRT. In designing the new Cunarders, the challenge lay in the propulsion system. Initially, Plans for each ship called for three quadruple expansion, five-cylinder engines, but it became clear that the reciprocating engines wouldn't achieve the desired higher speeds. Charles Parsons had proposed his steam turbine engines to Cunard earlier, and after careful consideration, they made the groundbreaking decision to equip both Lusitania and Mauritania with steam turbines. A 1 16th scale model of Mauritania's hull was built by Swan and Hunter, allowing for adjustments to the design. Construction costs for Mauritania reached 1.301 million pounds sterling. Guinard made a significant request to John Brown in 1905, asking them to convert Carmania's engines to turbines. The results were impressive, with Carmania gaining an additional knot of speed while requiring less fuel. It's important to note, however, that Lucy and Mari were designed with turbines in mind long before Cunard decided to add them to Carmania. Lusitania and Mauritania were named after the ancient Roman provinces, a decision reflecting Cunard's tradition of using the suffix ia. On September 20th, 1906, Mauritania was launched. Over 150,000 spectators crowded the banks on the opposite side of the river. Mauritania was the largest moving object at the time. She was longer than Lusitania by three feet and wider a beam by six inches. Not to mention her larger gross register tonnage and displacement. She slid down the slipway at 14 knots of speed, coming to a graceful stop 951 feet away with the roar of cheers from the onlookers being quickly drowned out by the blast of whistles and sirens a legendary ship was now in the water for the first time. Financial challenges emerged following the launch, as Mauritania's construction costs exceeded Lusitania's by a matter of a quarter million pounds sterling. Cunard questioned the discrepancy and Swan and Hunter's escalating costs. Labor and materials were more expensive in Newcastle than in Clydebank, and significant upgrades were necessary at Swan and Hunter's shipyard. Despite the financial hurdles, work continued, driven by the determination to meet the looming deadline. Mauritania's design included four boiler rooms, housing a total of 25 marine scotch boilers with 192 furnaces, generating a steam pressure of 195 psi. This head of steam powered the ship's four sets of Parsons turbo generators, producing 375 kilowatts of energy, enough to power a city with a population of 100,000. Charles Parsons provided six steam turbines for Mauritania with high pressure ahead turbines at the forward end of the outboard shafts, 
and low pressure ahead turbines on the inboard shafts. Two separate high pressure astern turbines were attached to the inboard propeller shafts, specifically for reversing the ship. After the disappointing maiden voyage of RMS Lusitania, where she failed to reclaim the coveted blue riband, attention turned to her sister ship, RMS Mauritania. The shipbuilding company, Swan and Hunter, had been diligently working to address the vibration issues that plagued the second-class spaces of the ship, a problem similar to what Lusitania had experienced before her maiden voyage. On a fateful Saturday, September 21, 1907, Swan and Hunter conducted unofficial test runs for Mauritania, just off the coast from the mouth of the River Tyne. To their dismay, the ship experienced violent vibrations when the engines reached 160 RPM. The shaking was most prominent throughout the second-class areas. Passengers would have found these spaces almost uninhabitable due to the severity of the shaking. Swan and Hunter swiftly took action, spending the following two weeks reinforcing the aft structure of the ship mirroring the modifications made to Lusitania before her maiden voyage. While the fix did not completely eliminate the issue, it did help dampen the shaking to some extent. On October 22, 1907, the day of Mauritania's departure from the Tyne to Liverpool for her formal trials, an iconic meeting took place. The world's first and fastest turbine vessel, Turbinia, was brought alongside Mauritania's hull. This symbolic encounter marked the introduction of the soon-to-be world's fastest ocean liner to its turbine-powered predecessor. As Mauritania set sail down the river, a quarter of a million spectators lined the shores, bidding a fond farewell to this magnificent vessel. During Mauritania's sea trials, it became apparent that the vibrations were not originating from the turbine engines themselves, but were rather felt along the propeller shaft alleys growing stronger towards the propellers. This puzzling phenomenon initially led to suspicions that the propellers were out of sync with one another. However, future investigations would reveal a different cause for the shaking altogether. As the final days of the trials approached, on November 6, 1907, Mauritania achieved an average speed of 26.75 knots, nearly two knots faster than her sister ship Lusitania. It was an impressive feat for a vessel of such immense size. Nevertheless, the high speeds resulted in rattling and shaking throughout the aft end of the ship, necessitating the securement of furnishings and fixtures to withstand the ship's tremendous velocity. Following the successful trials, Mauritania was formally handed over to Cunard, and preparations began for her maiden voyage, scheduled for November 16, 1907. The construction costs for Mauritania totaled £1,855,848, making her the most expensive ship ever built at the time, surpassing even the grandeur and expense of her older sister Lucy. Cunard took great pride in their new vessels, eager to showcase their engineering prowess and claim the title of the world's fastest ocean liner. In the preceding month, Lusitania reclaimed the blue ribbon from the German liners that had held the title for nearly a decade. The stage was set for Mauritania to surpass her sister's achievement and solidify Kinnard's dominance in transatlantic travel. The maiden voyage of Mauritania commenced on a promising note as the ship gracefully glided into Queenstown, Ireland to embark passengers and exchange mail. However, the ship soon found itself battling treacherous weather conditions while traversing the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. Violent swells caused the ship to pitch sharply, and the spare anchor broke loose, sliding uncontrollably across the decks of the forecastle. Captain Pritchard had no choice but to halt the ship and lead a team of sailors into the tempestuous weather to secure the anchor. Undeterred by the challenges, Mauritania pressed on through the rough seas, finally arriving at Sandy Hook at 11.13 a.m. on November 22, 1907. The ship had completed the transatlantic journey in an impressive time of five days, five hours, and ten minutes, despite battling heavy weather conditions throughout the voyage. Unfortunately, she failed to capture the blue ribbon from Lusitania, as she only averaged a little over 22 knots on the crossing. Mauritania sailed into New York that afternoon, greeted by an immense crowd, albeit not as large as the one that had welcomed Lusitania on her maiden voyage. 
Mauritania had yet to prove herself as the world's fastest ocean liner. With the completion of Mauritania's maiden voyage, Cunard and Great Britain were eager to see if this majestic vessel could rise to the challenge and fulfill the lofty expectations placed upon her as a pioneering creation of the seas. The Blue Riband, a symbol of pride and accomplishment, held great significance in the world of transatlantic travel. Many liners vied for this prestigious title, but its ephemeral nature meant that few could retain it for long. While Lusitania briefly held the Blue Riband, it was clear that her speed was not significantly faster than her competitors. Cunard's hopes rested on Mauritania, with the aspiration that she would demonstrate unprecedented speed, enabling them to retain the record for as long as possible. On November 30, 1907, during her return journey to England, Mauritania encountered thick fog, necessitating slow sailing. However, as the fog lifted, the ship accelerated, passing Queenstown on December 4th with an average speed of 23.69 knots. This accomplishment marked the capture of the eastbound crossing record from her sister ship, Lusitania. Over the next two years, a spirited competition unfolded between the two sister ships as they playfully wrested the Blue Ribbon title from each other. Unfortunately, Mauritania had yet to secure the record for the westbound crossing. That changed on April 11, 1908, when she achieved an average speed of 24.08 knots, shaving a minute off of Lusitania's previous record. An astonishing feat was witnessed on June 1st as Mauritania once again claimed the westbound record. What made this achievement even more remarkable was that she accomplished it with one of her high-pressure turbines out of commission. A month prior, Mauritania had collided with a shipwreck, damaging her propeller and stern bracket. Although the propeller was replaced with a more hydrodynamic spare, the bracket awaited repair. Despite operating with three propellers instead of four, Mauritania achieved an average speed of 24.86 knots, proving that her speed potential was far from reached. This remarkable feat convinced the public of the vessel's untapped capabilities. The vibration issues that plagued both Cunard liners were partly responsible for their restrained speeds, it was discovered that the turbines were not to blame. Rather, the interaction between the propellers and the water around them was the source of the problem. When the ships moved at high speeds, the disturbed water immediately around the hull would follow its contour and get sucked into the propellers. The outer screws, turning at full speed, would strike the calm, motionless water outside this disturbed layer nine times per second, resulting in the jarring shudder that reverberated throughout the ship. To mitigate this, Mauritania received specialized propellers which sliced through the calm water more efficiently, reducing the impact and vibration. Despite the vibration issues, both Cunard ships remained immensely popular, but it was Mauritania that consistently boasted higher passenger numbers per crossing, solidifying her favoritism among the public. Equally luxurious and well-appointed, Mauritania had captured the hearts of passengers, becoming the favored vessel. On September 2, 1909, Lusitania briefly reclaimed the westbound speed record from Mauritania, averaging 25.85 knots. However, this victory was short-lived, as just a few days later, under the command of Captain Daniel Dow, Mauritania snatched the Blue Ribbon for the westbound crossing for the last time, achieving an average speed of 26.06 knots. This incredible record would remain unbroken for a staggering 19 years solidifying Mauritania's mechanical prowess and etching her name in history. In a resounding triumph of engineering and maritime prowess, Mauritania stood tall as the epitome of excellence. Not only was she the more costly of the two majestic liners, but she possessed an indomitable spirit that battled ferocious ocean storms, refusing to yield to their mighty forces. With each roaring wave that threatened to tear her anchor loose, she stood firm, a testament to her unwavering strength, and in her quest for speed, she soared beyond expectations, capturing the coveted Blue Ribbon not once, but multiple times. Her record-breaking voyages across the Atlantic spoke of her unparalleled might and unwavering determination. Through it all, Mauritania reigned supreme, holding on to the Blue Ribbon for an astonishing 19 years, defying the relentless introduction of rival liners 
designed to challenge her throne. This, however, was nowhere near the end of Mauritania's story. She would soon face the loss of her older sister as the First Great War would commence. The Mari would have to serve her duty to the British Admiralty, and then afterwards try to survive the ever-shifting transatlantic passenger market. As the most esteemed symbol of maritime triumph, she left an indelible mark on history, forever celebrated as the embodiment of boundless achievement and unwavering legacy.